fun following my colleague and good friend Valerie. So now that Valerie has uh, scared everybody about the future connectivity of the cars, I'm going to try to bring some of all of this together and talk a bit about data exhaust. The gentleman from Deloitte mentioned data exhaust in an earlier presentation today, and I will continue on that theme. The mobile data exhaust is an enormous untapped resource. Previously, mobile data it was used for a lot of other applications. And now, with the advent of all this real-time data, we have things like Starbucks sending you a coupon as you're walking between Starbucks and Pete, trying to sell you the latest latte or something that you were probably going to buy anyway. This is real-time data. And there are a lot of companies, there are a lot of people looking at how to tap into the real-time data. But beyond, let's say, 15 minutes, <laughs> what happens with all of this data? It is a huge, untapped resource of data exhaust, coming from the cars, coming from the phones, coming from all the devices that we're wearing every day. The company that I work for, Streetlight Data, what we're doing is we are using this mobile data exhaust to really analyze patterns in transportation behavior. If you look at the short history of the internet, you realize we know so much more about the behavior of people based on surfing the internet, where they go, profiling, and so on, as compared to the patterns in transportation behavior. What do we know about transportation behavior? We know things based on analyzing road pavement putting sensors in the road, figuring out how many people travel day to day based on actual physical infrastructure. But this is all changing. What we're doing at Streetlight Data is we are really contextualizing this mobile data exhaust using a number of different categories of data. The first two are cellular exhaust and GPS exhaust, and I circle those because I will come back to those later, as that's where I really see the privacy issues. Cellular exhaust data coming from the cell phone carriers, GPS exhaust coming from the phones and navigation devices, and then some rather innocuous sources such as speed, volume, census, and other publicly available sources. And I'd like to just go through a couple of end uses here. This is a real life example from Oakland, California. And the area of interest is highlighted in black. And I'd, I'd like to pose a question out to the audience. You may or may not know anything about Oakland, but based on what you see here, could anybody take a guess of how many vacant retail and restaurants location sites there are within that black area. Anybody want to take a guess? One. Seven. <laughs> forty. Not four or fourteen, but forty. That is a staggering number. In traditional demographic analysis and urban planning and redevelopment, you look at this and you say, okay, well, let, we'll look at this area. Tremendous area of poverty, high crime areas. The Oakland Business Development Corporation has a mandate to, to figure out how can they encourage businesses to go into this location. And retailers in their right mind are saying, absolutely not. I don't want to touch this because I look at the area, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of crime. And this is a very traditional way to look at this. But if you step back for a minute and you look at this through the eyes of using the transportation data, you see something very, very different. If you look at the people that are traveling through the area in Oakland, you see very quickly that it's a crossroads for the Bay Area. From people coming from some very wealthy suburbs in the north and people coming directly over the bridge in San Francisco over to the Oakland area. 
And this is all based on the number of people moving through the area every month. Here again, we see the home locations of the people working in the corridor, which shows you something quite different than what you would see in traditional demographic analysis. Pretty obvious, these are some of the questions that we're looking at answering. And here are another, um, a couple of other use cases, which I won't go into right now. Except to show that it's a very different way of looking at target marketing, site selection, and analysis. And I just go through this very quickly because what I'd really like to get to is stepping back and looking forward and looking at the privacy issues that are highlighted in here. Are there privacy issues? Absolutely. We've, we've already come to, to that conclusion. And um, what I was thinking, what can I offer to this audience based on my, my own experience? When I first started uh, doing, doing this work, I went out and I had to license data from cell phone providers and navigation companies and others. And I, I found that there were a lot of privacy issues highlighted, yet the companies were saying to me, Kara, we have our privacy policy, we have our terms of use, but we're thinking that it's really not adequate. So would you consider working with us to come up with a new code of practice to help us uh, figure out the direction that we should be going in? And I think that what this really comes down to is partially some, some common sense. Um, I think that, secondly, we cannot, as in other areas, uh, wait for the law to, to catch up. I think that as uh, business leaders and scholars and others, we need to anticipate the changes to the law and to actually participate and educate the lawmakers, uh, for example, through forums such as the Center for Spatial Law and Policy, the International Association of, of Privacy Professionals. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on right now is to work with others in the industry to develop sectoral or industry-based codes of practice to talk about the levels of aggregation that are appropriate, um, to talk about the level of de-identification that might be appropriate. And in in fact, in my work now, I have certain guidelines that I've developed uh, whereby I will not accept data for use in our products unless the vendor actually agrees to certain levels of de-identification or anonymization or aggregation. My final comment is that I think going forward, we should not underestimate the power of the court of public opinion. If you look at the tweet map example yesterday and the question was posed, what if people knew? If people knew what we could do with their data, would they suddenly freak out and say, you know, you, you, you can't use this anymore? Well, to some extent, I think yes. And I also think that we will see more and more technological solutions being driven based on consumers who will smarten up and say, you know what, I am going to take control over my data and I am going to tell you what it is that you are allowed to do. Thank you. Thank you.